both Hong Kong and Singapore have consistently been ranked among the top performers in the world for their education systems. In this program, the focus will be on the Singapore education system. Professor Li Wing On, the OUHK's Vice President for Administration and Development, spent five years leading educational research at Singapore's National Institute of Education. He shares his insights into how Singapore prepares its students to be 21st century citizens through a strategy that integrates policy, research, and practice. It's really my pleasure uh, to share with you uh, my life in Singapore uh, over the last five years. I have to say uh, from the very beginning, I feel it was a great honor uh, to be invited to go to Singapore and to serve there. And I have to say I still miss them uh, as much as they miss me uh, because it was a, a very fruitful uh, five years and uh, the teamwork and team spirit there was very good and the support was also very strong. Uh, strong mutually and the whole working environment was very professional and very ambitious and very demanding and people in Singapore always say their life is very hard and I share with them only because you have not worked in Hong Kong. <laughs> the two cities are competing not only for how well things are run but how hard people are working. Uh, the only outcome is that people are working harder and harder and without limit and going further up to the hard work line. I would like to share what was happening in the last five years in education. I'm more interested in sharing a global picture, the global reform, global change, and how Singapore fits in, and how Singapore identifies itself in the world reform agenda. And it is based on this major agenda that Singapore uh, develop its policies and then try to ask for corresponding efforts at the education sector. Uh, I was in charge of research and so I had to address Singapore policy needs uh, to do the research. And of course my colleagues on the uh, teacher training side, they have to work very hard to train teachers for the 21st century. And so we have to work together and it was a very close and tight system. As many of you would know, actually even the two cities are very, very similar in many ways. There's a big difference. Uh, the major big difference between Hong Kong and Singapore is its governance system. I have to say Hong Kong is basically a bottom-up uh, uh, governance uh, scenario, but Singapore is a strong state, a strong government. Uh, there is very strong centralization. In practice, things are not happening in the way as outside people can see it. So I, I was very uh, pri privileged to have some years working as an insider and to tell you the struggles. Firstly, 21st century competence is a very strong agenda in Singapore. And if you look at the uh, documents, uh, policies, research, and how uh, pe people in Singapore will shape and talk about their teaching practices especially, you cannot miss the term 21st century. And if this 21st century agenda actually is part of the world agenda, uh, just before the turn of the millennium, people began to talk about 21st century. About 10 years ago when people but talking about 21st century, they only mean very loosely. There will be a new opportunity, a new time, something new has to come up. And generally, we can say 21st century is associated with knowledge economy, and there should be uh, lots of changes in the market needs and the economic restructuring, and we are facing more and more uncertain future, these kind of things. But uh, what should be the 21st century skill? What should be the 21st century knowledge? There was no consensus. Uh, people were talking different things and people were just making use of this jargon to say something new 
to say something fundamental and to say something drastic has to come along and to be expected. But after about 15 years of effort, the 21st century agenda has become more and more converging. Let me summarize some of the major efforts uh, happening in some countries. Uh, this is United States. The government has worked with the private sector, uh, the major private sector, especially in the ICT sector, including Apple, Cisco, Dell, Microsoft, uh, Intel, and so on and so forth. And working with all these major corporations to plot about the future of the U.S. education system. And U.S. has a very uh, urgent need to revamp its education system, especially during the last 10 or 15 years, when most of the international assessment exercises show that Asian countries are rising to the top. No matter how hard the American system works and the ed educators in America work, and no matter how famous they are, they have Yale and Harvard, St Stanford, and so on and so forth, and they have a very uh, famous people, their performance is always in the middle of the rank. So they felt quite uncomfortable. They felt uh, falling behind. They felt an urgent need to revamp their system. So they are working with those major corporations to revamp their system. And they call this P21 framework. If you take a look at it, it is a total revamp. Like Hong Kong in the year 2000, we, we launched an overhaul education reform with a 10-year agenda ahead. US is also proposing an overhaul of its own education system by redefining their core subjects. The new core subjects are mainly characterized by interdisciplinary subjects. So as much as we introducing key learning areas in Hong Kong, USA is also trying to integrate and combine different subject areas to form new subjects and new core. And this is the major picture. But also, more than curriculum change, and USA is also trying to build in assessment and national standards uh, so that they know where they are going. The reform is basically riding on the 21st century interdisciplinary themes as an agenda, as a notion for future change. And then the reform is quite organized and systematic. Develop national standards, assessment strategies, and then cascade into the curriculum and instruction, and then they will do professional development to align to all these changes so that teachers will develop new capacity to teach the new curriculum and new standards. Australia, now with Singapore and another four countries, and in total there were six countries, launched an ATC 21S framework. It is really an attempt to define 21st century skill or 21st century competencies. When trying to study about uh, 21st century attributes and characteristics, skills, or competencies, actually, at the same time, they are redefining uh, the focus of education by saying that for 21st century skill, we are focusing on ways of thinking, ways of working, and then tools for working and living in the world. So how learning affects your life. So it's almost like uh, UNESCO's four pillars of education, learning to be, learning to live, learning to work, and learning to work together. So a new philosophy, a new framework, a new thinking is being introduced, almost like uh, the P21 framework from the United States, introducing a new way of looking at the function and the future and how different bits of education and beyond education can be pasted together. OECD is also launching another schema, especially representing the Europe side of education reform. And basically the clusters of the reforms are represented in the three circles in this 
uh, diagram. Uh, focusing on interactive learning, autonomous learning, and also heterogeneous group, especially addressing to the increasing uh, diversity of the population because of migration in European countries. And so for 21st century, it is more and more emphasized towards the ability to work diverse ability groups, diverse ethnic groups. So the 21st century scenario is basically uh, ca characterized by diversity in many, many ways, coping with diversity. So this is the 21st century framework, mainly when, when we look at uh, the, the attributes, the skills, or, or the competencies, we reduce those skills into a few keywords, which all of you will be very familiar with. Collaboration, communication, ICT literacy, social and cultural competencies, creativity, critical thinking, productivity, and problem solving. And one interesting thing is, for the 21st century skills, they are all soft skills. They are not linked to any subject discipline. They are not subject strength. So the world is going softer and softer and look, looking for soft power uh, in, in their education reform. And so is Singapore. In the last five years, I was working with Singapore. Singapore totally mastered this trend and direction and absorbed itself into the world trend and tried to shape the education system and its implementation and also practices along this line. So when I bring you to Singapore, I want to bring you back to 1997. That year, Singapore has issued a paper, a position paper for the country called Singapore 21. This Singapore 21 was a paper that the Singapore leaders, they think of Singapore in the 21st century. What will we become? Where will we go? The decision of this paper is that Singapore will be positioning itself as a global and cosmopolitan city in the 21st century. And to be uh, able to achieve these goals, they think they have to develop new citizenry. And this new citizenry would be a vision of developing Singapore citizens to be cosmopolitan citizens, global citizens, and with full realization of internationalization and developing a culture of internationalization. Singapore citizens has to become global, so they should be aware of what is happening elsewhere. They should feel comfortable living elsewhere. They should be able to work elsewhere, but then with their heart still rooted locally. So globalization, internationalization are catchwords for Singapore to develop into the 21st century. In the same year, uh, the then Prime Minister, Kok Chok Tong, made a speech, which is a, a very significant speech that uh, has influenced Singapore's future development since 1907, was a speech on thinking school, learning nation. And you can see this speech is talking about shaping our future. And the whole speech, I have highlighted the, the, the word future, is future, 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 and future. So what is the future of Singapore like? It has to be a, a very brave new world uh, that they were envisaging. And they are trying to help the Singapore uh, younger generation to become a citizen in this brave new world. But most importantly, it is a future they see of intense competition and a future of changing values. So these are almost an endorsement of preparing for the unknown to come and how to prepare a nation uh, that can face the uncertainty to come. So it's a very, very brave agenda. And this agenda actually later was translated into an education policy, which is called Thinking School Learning Nation. This actually implies Singapore citizens, Singapore students need to learn to think. And not only learn to think, but think critically. And I think it was very successful. In the last election, the citizens were so critical that uh, 
uh, no longer over 90% voted for the PAP government. <laughs> Only 60% voted. The other 40% uh, was thinking differently. That caused a lot of concern about uh, the government. I actually give the government credit because the government became very liberal and tolerant in order to allow its own citizen to think differently. So how to manage the differences and the story? But this has been translated into the school policy. And the school policy since then is always talking about thinking, about critical thinking, about learning, not only from within, but from elsewhere. So that defines the nation's efforts. Part of the assistance to allow for this change is a major effort being devoted to develop an ICT plan for improving teaching and learning. There were three stages we can uh, identify about the development of ICT and education. Uh, the three stages were quite identical to Hong Kong's three stages. Firstly, to provide hardware. Later on, they find that uh, there may be too many computers given to the school and nobody knows how to use them. And later on, they think they need software. And then later on, after having hardware and software, then they, they realize having both hardware and software are not able to improve our education and classroom learning experience. We need teachers knowing how to use them, uh, optimizing, maximizing uh, the utility of ICT uh, into teaching and learning strategies. Uh, in the last 10 years, quite a lot of educational research, pedagogical research, are focusing on how to make use of some ICT to enhance teaching and learning. So that's basically the trajectory. But as I said at the beginning, Singapore is a strong state. It's a centralized uh, system. So everything was planned. So what you see from now is the planning uh, and how this plan became uh, materialized step by step. Firstly, the government set the policy, the context, and the priorities. And I work in NIE, the National Institute of Education. And the government, and that is MOE, because I, we always work with MOE and very closely with MOE. MOE set this policy, the policy I have just mentioned, and asked NIE, what will you do to help us carry out this policy? So the whole institute has to talk to the MOE staff and we had many, many meetings in, uh, inside the, our own institution. And there are many, many meetings with MOE staff and many iterative meetings. I was in charge of research, so I can tell more about research. And then every step, MOE examined our research, research agenda, research projects being funded, and then research results, and the impact of the research results. And we frequently report to MOE in the interval of uh, every two or three months. And so there was very, very close monitoring. And in the process, there were many questions and queries and asked whether we really had achieved what we promised to achieve at the time of getting the research money. So that was quite hard, hard time. But then, in order to test whether we are uh, successful. Uh, MOE always asks for organizational outcomes. Does your research impact your organization? Do you benefit from your own research works? And then the last question, which is the most difficult to answer. How is your research, how is your teaching, how is, is your teacher education change the student's outcome? Are our students learning better? Can you give me evidence that we learn better? What I want to say is MOE set has a policy. MOE translate this policy to the National Institute of Education. On the teaching side, they ask those questions. On the research side, they ask those questions. But on every side, they ask, are these changes making our students learn better? And what is the evidence? Basically, what I'm going to share will be in the spirit of this this kind of support and check and accountability and measurement. 
that's the organizational growth uh, in Singapore. In 2003, there was only one research center established. In 2008, there were already many centers of research set up, and the institute found they needed uh, to establish a bigger office, a research office, to contain them. So they created a dean position for this office, and then I was uh, asked to join in 2010, basically still a newly developed center, and to govern all these other centers. But if you look at the centers, it is quite different from the centers we see in Hong Kong, right? One is focused on practice. One is focusing on learning sciences, very empirical research. One is focusing on translation, scaling, and commercialization, means impact. If you have something good, can you translate this to other settings? Can you scale them up if you have impact? And can you develop commercial value so that people in the general public can buy some of your research products? So these were the agenda given to us. And the last one actually is almost like a QEF uh, in Hong Kong, but focusing on uh, proof of concept focusing on the adoption of ICT in the classroom. And, and a lot of these projects are collaborating with Microsoft and other very major uh, uh, ICT companies and teaming up with school. So a lot of software, a lot of those uh, ICT technologies are involved. So it, this is a research framework. There were three layers of priority. Number one is priorities on research development and innovation. This is a priority for immediate needs. So when the centers uh, were planning research, they have to identify what are the immediate problems. Like we have uh, student diversity, for example. We have low achieving students. We have some inequality in learning. Uh, streaming is a system in Singapore, and streaming is good to identify the elites and bad for those at the bottom of the scale. And how can you level them up? And there are gender inequalities. There are many pedagogical problems uh, in language teaching, and they test their students' language, not satisfied, and then identify, identify immediate needs. And then there are uh, midterm needs. So uh, the next level is strategic LD and I. What are you uh, envisaging? Uh, what will be the need in five years' time? I will gradually explain to you uh, in the process. And then they reserve a small amount of money, about 10% of money, to do blue sky research, to fund the research that is not related to education, but with some hope and imagination that in 10 years' time, after your ex experiment, this can be translated into education, so that we will have some breakthrough. We are not using the old framework to do old things or new things. We have to do something perhaps entirely unrelated to what we are doing. But 10 years later, then we may have some innovative ideas being implanted into the school. The research trajectory, that means the focus of research in general, also can be classified into the three phases, uh, which go alongside uh, the three phases of research funding. The first phase, a lot of research fell into the category of baseline studies. The most important baseline study is focusing on language, mathematics, and science, especially for language. There was a, a longitudinal, comprehensive research project to record what's happening in the classroom a representative sampling of the classroom at the national scale was identified. This was a really a big project, and, and then the research was to video this selected classroom for video analysis, for pedagogical analysis, to identify what are the major teaching models, approaches, and methodologies by the teachers that represent Singapore teachers' general teaching approaches. What are the major students' reaction, response, and also learning outcomes as a result of interactive, responsive 
to this kind of uh, teaching and learning approaches. This analysis was also used to match with all the research innovations being proposed in the first five years or earlier. See whether those uh, new ideas and new research findings can have any impact on what's going on in the classroom. So it was very empirical, and it was really like a, a, a representative slicing of a particular classroom, what's happening in the classroom, quite comprehensive. And a lot of money has been spent on this research in order to understand the general national picture of all the classroom and the major teaching styles. And then the next phase, following on the findings from the baseline studies, a lot of weaknesses, a lot of mismatch, a lot of implementation problem were identified. They really did not implement uh, the new policy, asking for changes were identified. Then the next phase, a lot of intervention studies were proposed, characterized by design classroom how to design a new classroom, how to break through. And so a lot of intervention projects uh, in order to compensate, rectify those teaching problems identified in the first phase. So a lot of intervention were studied and then were analyzed and a lot of good findings were generated. So I went in the middle of the intervention phase and develop a five-year plan, which is the strategic plan for NIE for the next five years. And the next phase is what we call translation and scalability phase. I had to take stock of what were found, what were the valuable findings, what were the value outcomes and results, taking stock of, about the findings of the last eight years and project them into the next eight years and how they will become impactful. They, be, they will become widespread and widely disseminated and widely adopted and widely adapted and widely adjusted and so on and so forth and then develop an organized picture for the government to consider. So some of these baseline study, as I have explained, is the major study we call core two is the scan of the classroom situation. There were IT plan, there were leadership baseline study, actually also uh, doing representative sampling of the school principals and middle-level leaders to look at the leadership style in all the, all the schools. And then there are international and comparative studies and to look at how Singapore and the other uh, East Asian countries where the similarities and the differences and many other things. That, these were some of the uh, projects in the baseline phases. And these are the intervention studies. The major approach is the task design or design class. So there were basically a lesson plan approach that will design a classroom, how to teach a lesson, and develop critical thinking and discourse. And we have some examples. For example, there was a very famous project called Productive Failure. Productive Failure is actually one of the problem identified at the baseline uh, uh, phase, uh, find that a lot, of, a lot of students feel that they are failure. Actually, in a streaming system, it's not difficult to understand. Other than the top 10, uh, the rest of the 90%, even you are top 20, you still feel you are failure relatively. So uh, this project is quite interesting. I mentioned it because they think failure is not a problem, but it's an opportunity for you to learn more. And one major assumption is that every learner can learn, no matter your intelligence, no matter where you rank. The second assumption is that I think it's quite groundbreaking. The researchers try to introduce new tasks, a task that no student had uh, encountered before. And the major finding is among the students, some of them are high, high performers, some of them are low performers. But if all of them are given a new task and none of them encountered before, the major finding in this research is despite the level of learning, despite uh, the smartness or the intelligence of the student, all the students had an equal chance to learn 
in a meaningful way. So that became one of the key approach that will ratify, that will level up the low performance in Singapore. And trying to argue failure is not a mock, but can be a blessing. Firstly, we learn from failure. Second, a failure can be productive. And the failure is against the constructivist approach to teaching and learning. The traditional constructivism argues that uh, your learning is based on your past learning. It's based on your past learning, then we introduce new learning. But this productive failure is, if we disregard the past learning, everyone can learn in the same way. But the past learning is where the inequality lies. That means in a classroom, some of the students already know, some of the students don't know. Those who already know will know more. Those who don't know never have any interest to know. So then the poverty cycle will begin. The rich will become richer and the poor will become poorer. So good students will become distinguished students. Bottom students will become extinct students. I mean, I'm going to introduce a group school project. It's designed to allow students of lower than top performers. And these are some of the projects that we try to introduce to overcome the present teaching and learning problems. These are the projects that we have scaled up. After all, we have impact on policy. We have impact on teachers' professional development. We have impact on classroom practice and pedagogy. And we have impact on learning outcome. By 2012, we did some benchmarking. Within 10 years, NIEs started from nowhere to somewhere. We look at our research publication. Our index was 4.28, but when I look at who are close to 4.28, we found Institute of Education, University of London, Teachers College, Columbia University. Stanford is a little bit further up, and we found some unimaginable figures, and we didn't believe it, but that's what we found. And then when we look at US QS ranking, we found NTU is being ranked alongside those other universities. And suddenly we didn't know, after 10 years of this kind of very systematic and very, very pressurized research and very hard research, some miracles took place. Uh, I have talked about too many things, actually, about what has been happening in research. This is time for me to reduce them into two key points. Most of the research efforts were spent on ICT for learning. If I have to summarize the focus of research, the, a lot of pedagogical research is to promote self-directed learning and collaborative learning. The first research uh, project I want to share with you, uh, my colleagues and I did in Singapore is a project called Group Scribbles. Professor Lloyd Chi Kit, uh, he's a professor uh, in NIE, uh, this uh, Dr. Chen Wen Li. She's from mainland China and working in Singapore. And they were the major contributor. And they have designed a software called Group Scribble. It is an uh, online post-it notes design. So instead of writing your brainstorm ideas on the paper, they ask the students to write it on the screen. And every student is uh, facing a computer screen uh, that they can write on. This is a simple design. Everyone has a public board, has a private board. The teacher asks a question on, on the computer, and the student can answer. It seems to be a very simple design, but it was a revolutionary design in, in teaching and learning. Why? When we were doing ed, uh, educational reform and pedagogical reform, we all know that uh, the, the major trend is to facilitate interactive teaching and learning, to encourage uh, teachers not to talk too much, but allow students to talk. And then t turning from a lecturer into a facilitator. But does interactive teaching really taking place in classroom? I give you an example. If the teacher asks one question, 
if there's a class of 40 students, if I ask every student to answer the question, if each question takes one minute, so how many questions can the teacher ask if the class time is 40 minutes? Only one question, right? Normally, uh, it's an unequal game when talking about interactive teaching and learning. Mostly, the very hyperactive students will raise hands, yell, and uh, shout, and then answer. And then the quiet students were sitting there quiet, stay quiet. And the teachers will not have time to uh, attend to those very quiet students. The teacher also needs some voice, uh, some noise, uh, so that the, the question and answer can continue. But it's not an equal participation, right? OK, if the quiz time is reduced to half a minute, you can only have half a minute to answer. So the quality of the answer is reduced by half. How many questions can a teacher ask in order to achieve interactive teaching and learning? Two. So all the examples you see are rehearsed examples. They are not really real. Sometimes we can split them into a group, a small group, but always it's the group leader who can report. The others, we don't know whether uh, they were having productive discussion or not, uh, but somebody has to report, and that person is, and is not representative of the group. So uh, it, there are lots of hindrances and obstacles to, pro, to really launch uh, interactive teaching and learning. But here, if the teacher asks a question, it takes only one second. And teachers can give two minutes, three minutes for everyone to answer. This simple tool also provides opportunity for students to write a sentence if you want, write a word if you can only have a word, or draw a picture. It is a breakthrough because when doing questioning and answering in a classroom, only the language capable student can participate. For those students who are sitting quietly not participating, part of the reason is that they don't feel comfortable with their language. They don't know how to express themselves. If you are teaching in English, in a, in a second language especially. So it's always the language capable students who have more opportunity to participate. The active students who have more opportunity. So the quiet students, the students not as capable in language will have less chance. But now, Students can only write a word, or even draw a small picture. Then that breaks the poverty cycle in language as well. Third, all these question and answers immediately go to the computer infantry. So it becomes a, a stock taking of all the answers given by the students. And they can be used for organizing, systematizing, generalizing, and rebuilding them into some kind of student-generated theories and concepts that the teachers can write on. The new teaching and learning actually is a higher demand for teachers. Demanding teachers' skill is no longer very much about teaching or lecturing. It's about generalizing, summarizing, synergizing, and elevating the discussion to a higher level so that the students really know you are capable of uh, making good use of students' an answer. And here, even students' casual answers can go to the infantry. So we can start a very simple knowledge building. What is more, suddenly, 40 students is not a problem. So we don't need a small classroom to have interactive teaching and learning. And actually, we need more students to enrich the infantry. For brainstorming, the most important criteria is that Students really give you brainstorm answers. If there are 10 students, you don't have much idea. If there are 40 students, you have four times more ideas. So actually, last class is better for brainstorming and knowledge building. So a small design like this, it has won many international prizes because a simple device can be used in a primary classroom, can function in so many ways. I want to conclude uh, my presentation with another very interesting project. I came across this project, and I felt very interested. It's a project teaching about Chinese idiom in a Singapore classroom. Uh, firstly, you, uh, you have to know 
English is the official language in practice and also the official language uh, in Singapore classroom. Especially for the higher achievers, they are all English first. Uh. Even though 75% of the population is Chinese, Chinese is very much a second language. So the level of Chinese in Singapore school cannot be compared to the level of Chinese in a Hong Kong school in general. So with, with this, you will appreciate uh, what I'm going to say. This is uh, Dr. Wang Longxiang in my research office. And he is a computer technician. He's not a Chinese teacher. He tried to facilitate learning of Chinese idiom in a primary school. Teaching Chinese is a challenge. People speaking good English will be perceived as better students. So learning Chinese needs a, lo a lot of encouragement and design. And learning Chinese is difficult if you are teaching general Chinese. Learning Chinese idiom is almost impossible because it is a higher level of language and it, it is classical Chinese. My research computer technician found a way. He compiled a stock of Chinese idioms to teach and then he wrote a software and we gave every project student, everyone has a phone and to use his software. The first thing he asked the student to do is now there's a mun mun ban lok or sao mu zhuk dou uh, go zhong go yang, hing go chai li, all this. Uh. Uh, he asked the students, what about Mun Mun Balok? Could you show some pictures about this idiom? And then after shooting some pictures, he asked the students to come together. Could you arrange these pictures in logical order? While compiling these pictures in logical order, try to think of a story that can tell the sequence of the pictures, what's happening uh, uh, according to your arrangement of the pictures. And then please share your story with your group members. Then after sharing with other students, please write it down. And then start the conversation. Dr. Wong did not know the significance of the sequence of learning he asked the student. The first step to face a difficult task of learning a language that is relatively strange to them and difficult for them is visualization. Firstly, he asked students to visualize. Second, a logical rationalization of those sequence. And then storytelling. So the storytelling is from visualization to logical arrangement and then to verbalization. And after the verbalization, there will be mutual feedback and response and discussion. Then the last is writing. So that's almost totally reversed the way we teach uh, Chinese and Chinese idiom. This computer technician doesn't know the meaning of the, of the Chinese idiom himself. <laughs> and he found a way, asked the students to make meaning. Uh, so, like the school school board, they are trying to address to the diverse ability of the students because a lot of the students, when they don't understand the letters and the words of the writing, they start with visualizing it. And they, they start to think about it logically. They start to create a story. They, then they start verbalizing it and they start discussing. After that, the composition is good. I end my presentation in, in this. I really enjoyed the research projects I did in Singapore. There were many, many other very interesting stories. But these two are just very simple device designs, uh, but they were making innovation in the classroom. Thank you very much.